is Beth Fowley. I'm the Director of Intercollegiate and High Performance Sport here at the University of Toronto. Um, and this is our sports specific rugby women's rugby consultation session. Welcome everybody. Um, there's a couple things that I just wanted to let you know about tonight. Um, the first one is that um, I have a presentation that I'm going to go through with you. I have changed it a little bit from the other presentations that I've done because I think it's fairly um, clear from the feedback that the women's rugby program does not wish to be part of the intramural program in the sport model, but rather in the intercollegiate program in the sport model. And I know that you have a presentation and I don't want to cut, I don't want the time to get too tight on your presentation and the things that you want to um, feedback into the faculty. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview. So some of you have seen this presentation already. Um, but it will be just a brief overview, and then we'll get right to your presentation, which is also on this computer, and then we'll go through that as well. Okay, hello, welcome. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to tell you. First of all, currently we have out some three models, um, three possible models for consultation. This is phase one of our consultation. All of the feedback is going to be gathered in, and that feedback is going to be put into the second phase of consultation, which will probably happen at the end of January, early February. And that will have, consist of two or three other models that will be put out for consultation again. So they'll be different than the ones that have been put out so currently. Um, the other thing I just want to tell you is that a lot of people have asked the question, why are we doing this in November? It's a very busy time. Good to see you. Um, uh, sorry, there's some um, alumni that haven't seen for a while, so I don't miss that. Um, why are we doing it in November in such a time when it's such a very, very difficult time, everybody's busy doing all the things they need to do? We did this intentionally, and we did this because we wanted to do these consultations and get the feedback when people were actually on campus. So many times when you do a change in a model and you're looking for feedback, people do that over a summer, and it happens over the summer, and by the time everybody gets back on campus, everything's done, and you're just moving on. That was not our intent, nor was that what we wanted to do. Um, we're very interested in the feedback from all of our stakeholders and uh, I just want to reiterate and I have reiterated to many of you who have sent me submissions yourselves, um, this is a true consultation process and this is truly about feedback. There is no back pocket model, there is nothing that's already confirmed and is ready to go. We are a long way off from recommending a model and we have a long way to go before we get to that point in this whole process. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly run you through th this presentation. It will only take about five or ten minutes, and then I'll answer any questions you may have based on this, and then I'm going to turn it over to you um, to do your presentation. Is that okay? Anybody have any questions about that? Um, we do have Sarah Hall. Hi, Sarah, again. Can you hear Sarah? Sarah. Yeah, I can hear Sarah. Okay. <laughs> Did we catch in a cup of coffee? <laughs> um, we have Sarah Hall on the um, on the phone, and Ed had asked if we could film the um, the presentation today and your presentation because there are other alumni who weren't able to be here, so that's why we're filming. We haven't been filming all of the other ones, and just so you know, I also am recording this because we are taking notes on everything, and so this will be pulled into the feedback for future um, consultation and future work on the sport model. Okay, all right. So. So the intent of our consultation sessions um, are to, oh sorry, this was our, these were our rules of engagement. So I'm not sure that we made the rules of engagement um, today with this group. Um, but just please make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, we'll identify who the speaker is and then you can have one follow up but then the next person will get a chance to speak and we'll come back to you for sure. But we want to make sure that whoever wants to speak has an opportunity to speak. Okay. Um, if you brought notes, which I think you did, if you can leave that with me, that would be great. I also have the presentation, which I will put into the feedback as well. Um, hey, Jane, come on in. Um, and please respect the opinions of others, even if you don't agree. Okay? So the intent of the consultation is to provide opportunities for interested stakeholders to review all of the documents pertaining to the sport model review process, which is on the faculty website, and I'm sure that everybody has already reviewed those. It's also to provide opportunities for stakeholders to review the possible models for intercollegiate, club, and high-performance sport, 
to provide various means by which interested stakeholders can provide feedback to the faculty regarding these possible models, but also to provide feedback regarding alternate models for intercollegiate high performance and club sport. The ways to provide feedback are to come to a consultation session, which you guys have all done today. Also, on the faculty website, there's SurveyMonkey, and you can see all three of their models, and you can actually pick one and provide feedback on. Um, or you can submit a written response, which some people have done as well. Why the review? Um, in response to a recent proposal review, and as part of the faculty's academic and strategic planning process, Dean Ira Jacobs charged a committee with the task of reviewing the current model of sport programming at the, in the University of Toronto's co-curricular program and creating recommendations as a result of their findings. What is the current model at U of T? Well, the sport model consists of various categories of program, each with different levels of commitment, competitiveness, and intent. The categories in, in the sport model include intramurals, tricampus intramurals, clubs, intercollegiate, and high performance sport. Within the proposals, 46 of the 47 current sports within the model continue to be offered. One requires further investigation. However, the category of program has changed for some. What prompted the need for change? A lack of competitiveness in the CIS sport programs, an inability to recruit top student athletes, gap in what the intercollegiate program offers and what it has the capacity to deliver, lack of resources to adequately support 44 programs, and significant risk management issues. Come on in. No problem. The current model attempts to deliver broad-based competitive sport opportunities through the intercollegiate and high-performance program. The expectation of athletes and coaches is that all 44 programs in the current model have similar access to facilities and services. A description of the possible categories, the varsity high performance sports provide the opportunities for student athletes to compete in a highly skilled and highly competitive sports structure that focuses on competitive success at the OUA and CIS levels. Performance is emphasized over participation. Varsity club sports provide the opportunity for student athletes to compete in the university sport program, which engages other post-secondary institutions in traditional and non-traditional sports structures. Competitive participation is emphasized over performance. And the KPE, which is kinesiology and physical education, club sports provides a positive sport experience for students within a recreational setting, which emphasizes student initiative and the opportunity for limited non-student participation. Rugby issues. So I just pulled out some information that we've been talking about in various submissions and various feedbacks going back and forth. We have an issue around facilities on and off campus, contact versus non-contact practices, artificial surface and back campus. We have concerns around training and games, sport medicine, intercollegiate reviews, which you guys fill out every year, and what comes back to us in the intercollegiate reviews, um, the greatest concerns and then the negative impact that these things have had on competitiveness. Other themes, if we get to other themes tonight, um, that we're looking for feedback on that are not specific to rugby, but are specific to the, across the entire program, are the language around varsity clubs, issues around branding, the word high performance and what that means to people, and excellence and competitiveness and what those mean to people. So those are some of the themes that we have been talking a lot about in the other consultation processes. And if we get back, if we get through enough, then I'll come back to these to get your opinions on some of these as well. So next steps, feedback is welcome from all interested parties between November 12th and December the 3rd. As I told, said, you, um, these are the ways that you can provide the feedback consultation online and written submissions. All of the feedback will be compiled and, and submitted to the Dean and the senior faculty members. Um, it's hoped that a decision on the intercollegiate club and high performance model can be made by March 2013. There's a lot of work to do in preparation for the next phase of consultation. So I'm not holding myself to that or the faculty to that, but that was the intent to try to keep moving the process along. So that's a benchmark time for us, um, not set in stone. 
And just so that you know, consultations on proposals concerning Child Campus and an enroll program will start in January 2013. So as I mentioned, this is an entire sport model review. This includes the intramural program as well. And so all of the things that are happening right now, intercollegiate club and high performance, will start to happen in the intramural program as well. So that will start in January. Okay, so that's... Hi. Come on in. Does anybody have any questions about this presentation? We're good? Yeah. Okay, so uh, who, who's going to... Oh, I'll say. Oh, you're going to get it. Okay, so well, I'll just yeah. open it up. Okay. Second, I was summoned to Beth's office and was told that varsity women's rugby will be among the intramural ranks. We don't take this program for granted. What was the first thing that I said this year when we took to that field and played against Lori in our home opener? Show varsity why we deserve to play here. You have to earn your right to be on this field. We know that. I knew that last year in the consultation with Beth with you in, in December. We know that. And what we're here to do today is to present feedback and some solutions and possibly dispel some myths and misnomers about the Women's Varsity Program. And at the end of the day, what we want to see is us to maintain our status in the CIS. So, there'll be four presenters. They'll address the criteria set out by Beth and the Sports Review Committee as to why women's rugby will become an intramural sports based on the sports models. The four presenters will be Bailey, there will be Amanda, Carla, and Danielle. And then I'll finish up with uh, an ending, and then we'll go into discussions after that. Okay? Oh, Um, we actually just went to the AS. Um, 
and I'm going to be presenting on field space issues. So I'm just going to go first through a little bit of an introduction that kind of sets the, the tone that I think our team is trying to approach um, on solutions. So we understand that like all teams at U of T have a shared interest in providing the success of U of T's athletic program. We also understand that flexibility and compromise are necessary in order for that success to be realized. Um, we believe strongly that there are viable field solutions that exist that allow women's rugby um, to remain at the CIS level at the University of Toronto. Um, we also believe that U of T Rugby contributes to the success and competitiveness of U of T's athletic program and to Canadian Rugby, and by making certain changes it can do, uh, it can contribute even more to the competitiveness of both U of T and Canadian Rugby generally. So first off, I'm just going to go through the field space required by a competitive rugby program um, using numbers and examples from other competitive rugby programs uh, across the country. Then I'm going to go through the options that, I, that could help alleviate field issues and outline the positives that could come from the adoption of an alternative, alternative proposal. So this is a direct quote from the rationale document and it's the appropriate time allocated is approximately 16 to 20 hours per week for the first team and 8 to 10 hours per week for the second team, for the second for training alone. Um, and while practice time is obviously absolutely crucial uh, to a team being competitive and being successful, uh, we are fortunate enough that actually women's varsity rugby far less field time than 16 to, 16 to 20 hours is actually required to create a highly competitive team. So in terms of actual field time uh, for highly competitive programs, uh, the first example is Santa Fex um, out in Anaganish, Nova Scotia. Um, and then, like I said, they recently just won uh, the CIS national title. Um, so they do, they do not have a first and second team. They only have one team of approximately 36 members. Or at least that's how many were when I was there. Um, their training per week is two hours Monday, two hours Tuesday, two hours Wednesday, two hours Thursday, and then an hour and a half on Friday, or like an hour of shortened practice the day before games. And then normally they tra travel on Saturday four games. So that's a total of 9.5 hours of training field time. So that's first NFX who just won uh, CIS Nationals. The second team I looked at is the University of Alberta, um, and I believe they just came third nationally. Um, and they practice two hours Monday to Friday, and again they travel on weekends for games. Um, so that would be a total of 10 hours in training time, um, field space required for these two very highly competitive programs. Um, and again, the University of Rhode does not have a first and seconds team. Uh, that is actually an unusual um, formulation uh, of a model for a women's rugby or a women's rugby program uh, within Canada. So that kind of goes over the number of hours needed to actually have a competitive program. Um, so uh, a highly competitive program. So some solutions to the field space issues. Um, we propose that women's rugby uh, move to be either based partially or fully at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Um, so the UTSC has two fully functional fields referred to as the Valley Fields. Um, and based on what we can find about the current intramural program at T UTSC, only a small handful of teams actually use these Valley Fields. Um, so the pros to fully moving the program are that we have access to really excellent facilities, increased re recruitment, um, we have a home team advantage by practicing where we were playing, um, we require no use of the really crowded downtown facilities, um, the equipment would be readily accessible and it would actually be a true tri-campus solution by moving one of the varsity teams out to Scarborough. So increased recruitment. Um, we think that basically operating at UTC UTSC could open up a brand new opportunity to draw in new recruits. And one of the reasons why UTSC, uh, we think especially, would be good for this is because it's less of a commuter campus than the downtown campus. And this means that the time commitment taken to be part of a varsity team would be decreased for people who went to UTSC and wanted to be part of the team. Um, in addition, there are a significant number of, of strong high school uh, women's rugby teams out in Scarborough. And a lot of people who are from Scarborough and went to those high schools generally go to the university there. It's a very common, like, high connection. Um, uh, school, um, and we think through rec focused recruitment efforts on Scarborough and its high school club area teams, we could increase our recruitment, um, and this would make us a more competitive team moving forward. So in terms of excellent facilities, uh, the Valley rugby fields, the already said, are rugby specific, 
Um, they are adequately maintained uh, necessity for athlete performance and safety, um, and especially because I know that one of the major issues in the rationale document was the risk management issue surrounding the back campus fields, which had um, been decreasing in quality, should I say. Um, I think we're going to test the, being too kind. the giant holes in them. Um, we feel like this would be a solution to those risk management issues and be a safe way to play rugby. Um, also, UTSC is undergoing a number of drastic modifications and upgrades to their athletic facilities. Um, and this is including a brand new field house, um, gymnasium, a multi-purpose program area, and a range of fitness and training rooms. Um, so they've actually just recently invested a whole bunch of money into making the facilities better, and we feel like we could really take advantage of that to increase our own competitiveness while taking pressure off the downtown core. So home field advantage, I've already run through this a bit, but basically that, I mean, we have not been practicing where we've been playing, and that is a disadvantage, uh, especially when you go away to other teams who do practice where they play. You get used to the dimension of the field, you get used to the, like, the bounce of the ball, um, you just get used to the area and feel more comfortable in it in terms of being able to play there. Uh, we also believe that the presence of a team practicing at UTSC, especially since they don't have any varsity teams currently practicing there, will help promote a strong fan base amongst fellow students and create more UT pride in, uh, in our school. So the other option is partially moving the rugby program out to UTSC. Um, this could involve, this would most, probably most definitely involve at least playing our games out there, which is what has happened previously. Um, I believe they did it most of the years leading up to this year, uh, which would, again, take some of the pressure off the facilities downtown. Um, it could also involve moving maybe some of the practices out to UTSC. Um, and the pros of this is that it's the benefit of sharing the commute between people who are from different parts of the area. So UTSC would still have less of a commute if you were practicing sometimes out there, and the downtown would have some commute, but not as much as always practicing out there. Um, I think the major benefit is less monopolization of any one field by um, using more than one field to basically take the pressure off everyone by you know, allowing that flexibility. Um, so this is a general overview of the pros of moving the program, either fully moving the program or partially moving the program. Um, either way, in terms of facilities, um, the fully moving the program requires no use of the crowded downtown facilities, where the partially moving program requires less use. Uh, the fully moving program has additional benefits, we think, improved recruitment, which would also happen by partially moving the program, but we think there's probably a stronger argument to be made that we will have better recruitment methods if we're, um, if we're just at UTSC. Um, in both cases, we have greater access to excellent facilities because UTSC has just done all these investments that have really brought their facilities up to a really high level. Um, and so those are, that's just kind of an overview. So in terms of travel, this is obviously a concern if you're moving it out of the downtown core, since a lot of our players are from the downtown core, that we hope to get more UTSC, many more UTSC players by partially or fully moving it out there. Luckily, Scarborough campus is actually easily accessible and affordable to players via public transportation. Um, and in the coming years, it's expected the transportation is going to get better and better going out to Scarborough as more and more people are making that commute. Um, in addition, athletes might also carpool as the distance is less than 250k. Um, as per the university risk management policy. So carpooling uh, together would also be an option which would be uh, fairly cheap if we all shipped over gas and uh, you know not particularly onerous in terms of, less onerous in terms of time. So in terms of additional field time, while not ideal, our team would also be willing to offset University of Toronto field time with some private field time. Um, and it's financially viable for us to use uh, Lamport Stadium or another private facility. We've actually been in contact with Monarchs uh, Fields um, and are trying to figure out if that could work in 2013 um, for off-season training. Uh, our finances will actually be addressed later in this presentation by Danielle. This is just saying that it is financially viable for us to do this. It is also possible for in-season to run non-contact practices on field hockey turf. And I know it sounds strange because we're rugby players and we it's a full contact sport. There actually are times where it's very appropriate for us to run non-contact practices. Such as the practices directly for a game um, are usually entirely non-contact because there's not enough time to recover. Um, as well as learning and practicing plays, it's, all, it's, all, it's usually done in an entirely non-contact manner. Um, because you have to get those emotions and understand those emotions before you can start putting contact in. So these are kind of some of the final conclusions. Um, to start with, less than 10 hours of field time for training is sufficient for a highly competitive uh, women's rugby team, as evidenced by SANFEX and the University of Alberta. 
Um, moving the rugby program either partially or entirely up to UTSC uh, would help to alleviate some of the field issues. Uh, there are a number of positives to the move that we think will help to increase our team's competitiveness and therefore fit better within the new model for U of T. Um, this is including upgraded facilities, improved recruitment, and home field advantage. So kind of as a final statement, um, clearly there are many solutions that enable the University of Toronto and its athletic department to keep the IS women's rugby um, while we all work to strengthen the competitiveness of our many teams. So I'm now going to pass it off to Carla, who's going to speak uh, specifically to the competitiveness issue. Um, so come on up, Carla. Can we ask questions as we go along? Yeah, do you want to pause and ask questions now? Is that okay? Yeah, just a I'm couple of, of points, because I think this, that's suggest. excellent. Um, there's a couple of things that I just want to tell you. Um, we currently have baseball and tennis at UTSC. And fully, and baseball is fully training and competing, and it's been hugely successful. So um, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first, but it would be first CIS. It, first CIS. First CIS. Program. CIS there we go. Yeah, yeah, no, first CIS program for sure. But it has been very successful that what we've done with baseball there. So that's definitely, um, definitely a, a good idea. Um, the 16 to 20 hours was men's and women's. Oh, combined. In the, in the original document. Oh, the two yeah. programs. Oh, so, sorry, I didn't understand no, that. No, that's fine. I mean, exactly what you said. Yeah. We calculated 10 hours uh, per week, okay. two hours, five days a week. Um, but multiplied it by two because it was for both programs. Oh, okay. So that's cool. But I mean, we're on the same wavelength as to how many okay. hours it takes for sure. Yeah. So I, yeah, there's some, some great things in there. Is there anything else anybody wants to add or bring up? <laughs> Carla. <laughs> So I'm going to discuss um, the idea of competitiveness and the state of the CIS Rugby League and, and how U of T fits within it. Uh, my name is Carla Teledetsky. This is my second year at U of T. It's actually my fifth year of eligibility. Um, I played three years at the University of Alberta prior to coming here. So this slide summarizes basically the state of the CIS League. There's 28 teams in the CIS, and um, I summarize kind of by conference who the main conference title winners are every year. So um, in the Atlantic League, League St. FX has won the title for the last 15 years. Um, <laughs> In Ken West, Alberta has won eight times, Lethbridge six times. Um, in OUA, Guelph has dominated winning 13 OUA titles. Waterloo has received two, and Western has received four. And then um, in the Quebec League, for example, Concordia and Laval have been the only two teams battling it on the final for the past seven seasons. And when you look at the national championships, there's actually been only five different teams that have ever won a CIS national championship. And what this shows, perhaps, is that there is somewhat of a, I would say, a, a tiered system in the CIS league where there are some very competitive schools, and then there is a lower middle tier of competition within those schools, and that competition is still very important, still very valid. Um, you obviously couldn't base the CIS League, I don't think, on five teams. Um, so we'll go on to discuss the state of women's rugby in Canada. So Sevens Rugby is going to be in the 2016 Olympic and the uh, 2015 Pan American Games. And Rugby Canada has identified a high performance pathway in order to um, develop women's rugby in the country in order to bring athletes up to that Olympic standard for 2016. Um, currently, over 95% of the national senior women's team has come through the CIS structure. They have actually identified the CIS as their main, um, I guess, infrastructure for developing high performance athletes because it's already there. Um, they've also stated it's the best way for them to advertise rugby to young girls. Um, at a high performance level. And this national senior women's team is consistently ranked in the top four internationally. And so the reason why this is important is national coaches, they're frequently attending CIS games to scout for talent. 
And U of T is in a very fortunate position um, due to its location. So um, they'll typically, the coaches will typically attend provincial nationals, and they'll typically attend CIS nationals, and then they might host um, talent ID camps elsewhere, but otherwise, if you are in Ontario, for example, you might have a coach just show up to one of your league games. Um, and, and that's something that happened to me, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but being based in Toronto, which has so many high-performance rugby athletes and is actually a high-performance centre for Rugby Canada, um, is really advantage for us as a team. So here's an example of just a selection of some U of T players who have achieved a high level of success. Um, there's a much longer list than this, I just put a few in. Um, and it kind of spans from the beginning to currently. We have had CIS All Canadians, we have had players on the national team, we have had players go to World Cups, we've had many, many players represent their, team, their province um, playing provincially. Um, we have Cats, we even have an Olympic gold medalist as, as one of our alumni. So, my experience, as I said, I played my first three years of CIS eligibility with the U of A and the last two with U of T. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is it's not like I change, I guess, drastically as a player when I moved from U of A to U of T. But what are different here are the opportunities to get um, perhaps noticed by a national coach. So at a York game, I was actually noticed by Sandra Fiorino, who's the current assistant coach, and I was able to go to the NAFA 7th tournament in Barbados in November 2011. From that, I was also able to go to the 2012 FISU games. I don't think that I would have been able to do that if I had been at the U of A. Even though that is a more competitive program, U of T is, is very nicely situated to spit out some high performance athletes to the program that is quite centered here. Um, part of the reason for my success, I believe, is the coaching staff. So this year our head coach was Edward Sun, Eddie. He um, actually coached the Ontario Senior Women's Team to a gold medal this summer. And I know for a fact that he uses, as he stated before, his experience at U of T to, to try out new things and to realize how to push players to their fullest because we do have a wide variety of experience. You might have a first year who's directly out of high school and may not have played a lot of senior level rugby. And then you might have the graduate student or the doctoral student who's been playing rugby for 10 years um, and, and he's really worked with that quite well. Um, he's also NCCP level 3 certified and he's entered the high performance pathway coaching development program. Um, we had two assistant coaches this year. Um, Lisa Newton, she's here tonight. Um, she has 40-20 caps and 14 senior caps for Wales. Um, she played university rugby, she captained her team. Um, she's also played in the 2010 Rugby World Cup and three Six Nations tournaments. She has a bachelor's in sports coaching and a higher national diploma in sports coach, coaching and development and she also is a certified personal trainer. Um, and then our second assistant coach is Andy Ireland who has extensive playing experience as a professional um, athlete playing for the London Wasps, and he also has even more coaching experience in England, where rugby is, I mean, absolutely huge, as well as in Canada. So, um, pivotal to the success of any team is obviously training. So, we have currently been practicing three to four times a week. Um, in our model, we've presented practicing five times a week, and. Currently, we've been having our coaches provide strength and conditioning programs for us to follow during the off-season. We've also supplemented that with indoor training sessions in the field house to work on rugby skills. And then in addition to that, our summers are spent playing club rugby. So um, we would like to, to become a competitive program, ramp this up even further so we have even further um, emphasis on training and, and training support. I conclude with um, a few quotes that were sent to us from coaches in the OUA League. This one is from Waterloo, and they attest to what I mentioned earlier about the disparity between student teams, and they say that 
U of T has been a very competitive game for us in each of the three years that we have coached in this league. In a league where the disparity among the top teams and the bottom cannot be disputed, having such a competitive game that challenges both sides is invaluable to us. And this is coming from a school that we beat last season and they were ranked eighth in the country at that time. Um, coaches at Sir Wilfrid Laurier University um, said that there are so many strong female rugby players in the Toronto area, and the loss of a program would have a huge impact on not only those players, but the OUA and CAS rugby programs as well. And then finally, from Trent University, um, the Varsity Blues women have hosted national championships, won a silver medal, produced all Canadians, academic all Canadians, and Olympic gold medalists. Moreover, they have provided a highly competitive challenge, which has fostered the values of commitment, dedication, and teamwork to 13 graduating classes of doctors, lawyers, teachers, coaches, and business leaders. Um, that concludes my presentation, and Amanda will be presenting next. If there's any comments or questions.
um, and Fear Donnelly found is that out of the 7,815 team roster positions for females only made 44% of the Canadian at large totals, whereas males had 9,933. So there's arguably a 2,000 participant gap in between female and male competitiveness in CIS. So taking away CIS from the U of T, the university further breaks away from the desired results of both U of T sports policy, gender equity, and CIS um, performance. The report notes that when these percentages are compared at large across the 52 Canadian universities that offer CIS sports, there are significantly less male students, yet they have um, they have a greater opportunity to involve themselves in high performance athletics, which demonstrates the inequalities and gender issues of Canadian inter university sports. The opportunity to, present, uh, to represent oneself at a university on a varsity team is disproportionately available to male students than their female counterparts. And the CIS encourages all Canadian universities' athletic departments to immediately establish a preliminary equity target of 50% participation opportunities for, females, uh, for female athletes which will not be met should you accept the sports models at present and demote CIS women's rugby to intramural status. Um, for the past two years, I sat on the intramural board of directors and the She's Got Game initiative um, actually did promote to enhance women's involvement in, in intramurals and address the competitiveness um, that I was just talking about within uh, the, the university. And although it does try to boost the level of women involvement, it takes away from the varsity team it doesn't offer us that competitiveness. Um, not to mention that the women at this university aren't necessarily keen to involvement in such a, I guess, non-traditional sport such as rugby. Um, their main focus and main desire would be on a sport such as soccer or volleyball. Um, so Carla spoke to this as well. Um, looking at the Canadian National Seniors Women's Team for Rugby, nearly every single member of that team has come from a CIS level university, whereas looking at the other sports, um, such as hockey, soccer, and basketball, the three teams that have represented Canada in the Olympics, they are primarily consisted of NCAA players. So again, taking away a competitive program at the U of T further hinders the um, NSWC's farm teams, I guess. And then it's Danielle with um, finances. And I will leave this for you here if you'd like. Okay.
they're not fees that need to be, or not equipment that needs to be replaced every year. And then, in case you're wondering about the discrepancy in uniform costs, that's because we bought extra uniforms in the 2011-2012 season that carried over. Some new expenses that we look to, that we've investigated um, for the upcoming season would be if we initiate an indoor season, if we hire a full-time coach, hire a personal trainer, and hire a manager. And then with these, we hope to increase our competitivity. Um, looking into an indoor training season, we've explored the possibility of renting a Lion Court Stadium. They have an indoor turf field that you can rent throughout the winter. And this table provides um, how much the cost would be to have a, run a 13 week training season. Um, we would run this in the second semester, and 13 weeks would take us from the week we return from winter break to the week prior to exams. Um, allowing this type of training program with four hours a week spread over two practice sessions would allow players to maintain a high level of fitness, develop rugby specific skills, and grow as a competitive team. In terms of the coach, we think it's important that we have a full time coach with us. Um, and we'd like to propose that Lisa takes on this position. In addition to being a coach, she's a certified personal trainer, so we would hire her for that position as well and are not looking to pay for two different um, people to take these roles. Um, if we remain a high performance sport, this, um, the payment for Lisa would come from the varsity board as it is for other high performance teams but I'm also going to present a model in which we would cover the um, cover payments in Lisa stipend out of our budget by increasing player fees. Sources of income 
to make it possible to keep this going beyond our three years. So that concludes my presentation. I would welcome any questions now. Hi, Daniel. What are exhibition fees? Um, exhibition fees. This year we went to Trent to play a preseason tournament. Oh, So that's, so that's pretty much what we've got. And so at the end of the day, we really wanted to try to address what Beth has set out in the criteria uh, on November 2nd. And I think that date is really galvanized what uh, varsity women's rugby really means to the University of Toronto. And so when you look at the criteria, the, the biggest question for us is, will Scarborough campus take us? Like, that's the big question. Why should they take us? Right? But when you look at the competitive side, we have players going to represent Canada from the University of Toronto. There's a long history of that. Obviously, we have some lean years. I mean, every team has lean years. But I, I get it. I mean, you can't have five lean years. <laughs> That's like a whole graduating class. There's no way. And I understand Beth's pressure that we want to produce competitive teams. But then again, once we get into her presentation, what does competitive this really mean. I mean, I think that's something that we'll, Beth will, will address to us a little bit later on. But when you look at the, when you look at the coaching staff and you compare that coaching staff throughout the country, it is just as good, if not better, than what they offer at UBC, U of A, Saint FX, Guelph. The standards there. The, the, the leadership structure is there. The player structure is following. This is something that's workable. But the main issue is, if you really need to drive this program into a higher level, you need a full-time coach. You need to drive this. And the perfect candidate would be Lisa, as I would step down but still help. But she is definitely something that the girls, the players, will look up to. Not because she is, um, she is a player in her own right, but she is an international player. She's got international experience, her coaching background, 